Hello, Clark. Hello, Hello there. Yeah. Bonjour, I should Bonjour, say. Bonjour, yeah. Now, um, so I'm in Scotland, where it's about to start snowing again, apparently. You are in Paris. What's it like there? Well, uh, as you know, because we were, you were over here a couple of weeks ago, uh, I'm looking out at uh, a beautiful view of uh, 40 miles of Paris with the Eiffel Tower. Uh, it's all looking good. Pollution is very limited. Uh, so I've got a very nice, expensive view here. That sounds lovely. <laughs> we can. Uh, it was lovely to meet you. The other yeah. Week. Uh, and, and Paris is, is uh, spectacular. Yeah, but you know, I worry about why people come and visit me because uh, usually the second time they visit, they bring their wife or husband and their kids. You know, so I realise it's not a very professional visit. They just want to take advantage of the view. So. Yeah, you you, you probably have the best view I have ever seen in anyone's office ever. It's nice, nice and expensive. It was very nice. Okay, so today. Um, if I just frame it for people that are listening, so I, I, I was in Paris uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, I had a fascinating time talking to you, and there were quite a few little uh, bits and pieces that, that, that I picked up, and I actually noted them down, uh, and, and maybe we'll come back and discuss them. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, but first, how about, could, could you tell us how this all started for you, how, how your TOC life started, and... And I know it featured um, our uh, a hero, I guess, uh, Ali Goldrat. Yeah, well, um, I'm a sort of half French, half English, uh, living in Paris, uh, British passport and stuff. Um, and uh, I started my career in industry in France. I have an engineering uh, degree. Uh, and very quickly, in the first six months of working in industry, I discovered what today people call lean manufacturing. That was uh, 31 years ago. Um, And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, Two years later, I was hired by somebody called uh, Eli Yaugoldrat, never heard of him, uh, who uh, was uh, creating a, well, setting up a firm here in Paris called Creative Output France. And uh, this is where I I started my, my, my lean journey. Oh, sorry, my theory constraints journey. So I've been doing basically lean and theory constraints now for uh, for 29 years, and um, that's that's uh, the, the the short end of my story. Right now, um, I'm the CEO of Maris Consulting, based in, in Paris. I have been the company is uh, 10 years and two weeks old, um, and before that, I was a, a horrible consultant in a, a big consultancy firm, and before that, I did uh, I worked uh, I had a proper job in industry when I started off my career. Um, so that's me. Right, cool. So 29 years. Um, I'm not going to do the maths uh, and record it, but um, a- am I guessing 85, 86-ish? 80, yeah, uh, beginning of 86. 86. The, I was still at school then. Yeah, the, the goal had been published, but in a sort of confidential manner in 84 in America. And one of the first things I did when I joined Delhi was to publish the uh, French translation uh, this will, this will show you my age sort of thing. I've got, uh, so uh, I, I arrived when uh, when the, the, the goal, this is the ed- original edition uh, in uh, American, uh, was published. Uh, I helped translate Le But, which is, this is the uh, uh, 1986, uh, maybe 87 French edition original. And when I, when I met Ellie, he was doing something that he, he tried to forget about the rest of his life, which is things like this. Uh, the Opt software, which you know, this will show you my age. It's got uh, it's got lovely stuff in here. Um, it's got things like this. Okay. Now I know that you youngsters aren't going to uh, know what this is. This is a, a five and a quarter inch floppy disk, 1985 Creative Output, uh, which tried to teach people how to uh, manage things like bottlenecks. Okay. So, yeah, I I uh, I've been doing this for a while. Well, that's impressive. I actually have a copy. Uh, I managed to get a second-hand copy of the first edition, um, but I've ne- never read it. But I actually, I, I really want to, to to compare the the before and after version um, as it's changed. But okay, so you started out. You you worked with Ali for a few years. Yeah. Um. And now you're a consultant working across France mostly. Um, now, so okay, so here's the bit that that I find found most interesting talking to you, um, is that 
your interest is in applying the goal and critical chain, the, the stuff in those two books, uh, to actual real life businesses, rather than the, the thinking processes. Um, and, and you seem strongly bent to actually kind of like doing real stuff. Could, could you maybe tell us a bit, bit, bit about what you do or and why you chose yeah. that? Um, well, there, there are many things to, to answer that question. Uh, one of them is that I have a, I don't know, a, a deeply ingrained, maybe genetic passion for, for manufacturing, for factories. Uh, and designing and making things is, is just, you know, what I really enjoy in life. So I'm never far, you know, here I'm, I'm in my office, but... Uh, where I really enjoy myself is when I'm uh, I'm working with clients in their factories, building things. Um, so that means that you know both uh, theory constraints and lean have been something very very important to me because they are uh, important transformations of uh, the way people design things and make things. Um, so uh, I do a lot of that. Uh, I guess I'm talking about uh, somewhere somewhere between 100 times and 200 times now. I stopped counting, um, implementing it in, in various uh, sizes of companies. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm a sort of very down-to-earth, uh, practical guy, and uh, I hesitate about talking about it or, or thinking about it too much because um, I'm, I don't know, uh, the theory of constraints is not being used enough throughout the world. Uh, it's, it's very much a marginal thing. Um, and I think people everywhere, everybody who knows some or, or most of the theory of constraints should stop talking about it and do it. Uh, and uh, that's why, you know, uh, although we're, we're doing this podcast now and talking about it, I spend most of my time doing it. And uh, that's, to me, the most important thing. And it's also where I learn the most. And um, as far as I'm concerned, thinking processes, I, I've already said this publicly, is a... Uh, is a double-edged sword quite dangerous for the theory of constraints because people spend all their time talking about it. It's not very easy for somebody coming in from the outside to understand what's going on. And uh, it puts quite a lot of people off uh, the theory of constraints. Okay, When there are these beautiful solutions, you've mentioned uh, drum buffer rope in manufacturing and critical chain. There are, there are other solutions with regards to uh, supply chains, sales and marketing, account, uh, financial decision-making, throughput accounting and stuff. All that stuff for me is 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 what I I, I really use and think about, um, and uh, it's not much of the thinking processes. Um, to put it uh, more more violently, uh, if thinking processes were so powerful, I think they would have solved the problem by now, and they haven't. Um, but I, I don't I, I don't refute uh, the, the thinking processes. I still think they they they, they will probably lead somewhere. Uh, but they're not as powerful as people claim they are today. Uh, and too many people in, in the uh, theory constraints community are spending all their time on that, not actually making any money with drum buffer rope or critical chain. And that's not good for, for the theory constraints. I have a, 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 a great relationship with uh, Bill Detmer. And uh, he will be coming here in the month of June to give a six-day course on uh, the logical thinking process. And I'm gonna I'm gonna follow that and try and try and learn. You know, it's not because uh, I I tried being both a, a, a free thinker and uh, open-minded, and it's not because uh, I'm for the moment not convinced by the thinking processes that uh, I won't try and learn more and, and try it and stuff. And I I could you know I could give you several examples of the, just this year uh, the last uh, three months where I've seen good stuff coming out of thinking processes. But they they are, they're overrated. Uh, people should, should uh, not spend too much time on that, and don't forget all the beautiful stuff that came out of you know the the goal, the critical chain, and all that, uh, because that still works. And uh, it's uh, I find in, in my world more impressive for a, a CEO when you tell them, okay, here you are, you you just made ten more million dollars, uh, yes. rather than you know show him a gold tree and say, isn't that nice. Um, <laughs> And so they, I, they, I like, they you know, solve different problems, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And um, I, whenever I, because I, I do, I do use them a bit, or I, and around me people are using them, but I never start with that. I wait until they've made, you know, uh, a million or ten million uh, dollars or euros, and then I say, you know, by the way, uh, it's a good idea to think clearly, and uh, common sense is not so common, and all that stuff. So um, 
it's there, but it's never. I, I never start that way. No. Okay. So, how about then? If um, how about we get really concrete and roll back? Um, I, I know sitting behind you is your logo. Um, you, you 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 pointed this out to me um, when I was in your office, and I, I think your your mum painted that. Is that correct? Uh, how hi mum. Um, hi mum. <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah that's uh, the, the actual logo looks sort of like um, this. Um, so it's it hasn't got the colours and stuff, and that's my mother's uh, interpretation of it. And uh, we've got we've got these sorts of things all over the walls here uh, in various sizes and colours. Uh, and uh, I can't think of any problem in other terms than that, you know. But uh, for obviously all the theory constraints practitioners, it's fairly obvious what I'm talking about is the the bottleneck in the middle somewhere that you have to find. The little guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So could you roll it back right to to the you, you were telling me there's a story behind where that diagram came from. Ah, uh, yeah, I will show you my age. Uh, I did that the first time in in the Pyrenees in in uh, when I was 28 uh, in 1986, uh, 88, sorry. Uh, and again, this is going to be uh, understandable by about a dozen people left uh, in the world. Uh, it was basically case coil, the V-plot case study that people used oh. in creative output to teach how to manage yes. a uh, V-plot because, uh, you know, I went through the training and stuff. And this was a uh, case coil. Uh, it was, you know, it made sheets of metal and, uh, and cut them and rolled them up and stuff. And they asked to do an analysis. I did an analysis. They had five machines. So I drew that on the wall and said, you know, the problem is here. And, uh, well, that's been with me for quite a few years now. And it's become the, the, the company logo. I put it on the cover of my book when it was published. Uh, and as I say, uh, I think my colleagues get sort of sick and tired of me referring to these sorts of things all the time. Oh, and by the way, talking about books, this is just a, a little plug. Don't forget hey. to buy and read this little thing by him there, over there. Uh, Rolling Rocks Downhill. Okay, uh, great stuff. And uh, uh, we'll be putting ourselves out some videos about that too, won't we? We've started. Anyway, where was I? Uh, war stories. Um, I could go back that, to, to, to those days, but uh, I'll, I'll give you just something that's, that's going on now. As I say... Um, I've done a hundred or, or two hundred of these things, uh, and I'll just give you the one that's freshest in my mind because we're, we're doing it at the moment. Um, it's a uh, plant and not far from Paris, uh, 400 people in the aeronautics business. Uh, they make flight control systems, the things that make planes go up and down, left and right. Uh, and they called us in because uh, they had a big uh, uh, due date delivery problem. And uh, they tried many, many things over the past uh, five, ten years. Um, some of the, well, the most expensive, well-known consultants in the world, some of the best plant managers in the group. The group is uh, 35,000 people uh, with factories all over the place. And uh, the clients, the, who are the largest uh, airplane manufacturers in the world, were just absolutely furious. And uh, they'd stopped, they'd put them on new business on hold, so they weren't uh, soliciting them for, for future airplanes. And so basically this factory was going was to die, and everybody knew it, uh, because uh, it couldn't deliver on time. Um, so they, they, they asked me in, and um, they, they presented their, their factory, and they brought me into a meeting room and uh, put up lots of slides with... Uh, data from SAP showing, you know, these, this is the, the, the workload on these 12 bottlenecks. They already use the word. We have these, these, these gulu, uh, 20, uh, 12 of them. <coughs> nice, big, sexy-looking, uh, expensive machines, you know, bzz, 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 and all that. Uh, and they showed you, the data shows that they're all overloaded, so that's why we're late. Um, and, uh, okay, I said, uh, let's go down to the, to the shop floor, right, you know, this thing. Uh, uh, and let's see what's going on. And so I spent uh, two, maybe three hours down there uh, before it was fairly obvious what, what happened. In fact, uh, to be frank, uh, this time my one of my colleagues, Selim Ben Luka, uh, who's been working with me for, for eight years now, he found it first. Uh, I would have found it maybe in the next 15 minutes, but anyway, he found it first. Um, 
How do you how do you find a bottleneck in in these sorts of plants? Well, uh, it, it's horribly simple, really, and you know I'm just sort of surprised how many people have problems. Uh, you have to accept there's a bottleneck, uh, so you know you're, it's there. You just have to find it. And what you do is f look at where uh, work has piled up, right? Where there's a, there's a huge pile of work waiting. And so uh, it was staring us in the face. I mean, there was the, the, the factory had all the machines on one side, a corridor going down, the main corridor, which everybody walked up and down. And on the other side of the corridor, uh, there was the quality uh, control department. One couldn't see the quality control department because it was all hidden behind piles and piles and piles and piles of work. And so, you know, they, they, they kept showing us these machines, these expensive machines, that's bottleneck number one, bottleneck number two, and a bottleneck number 11, number 12. And, and we turned around and said, well, what's all this uh, on the other side of the, of the alley here? And they say, oh, that's waiting for quality control. I said, quality control? But that's not, you haven't talked about quality control. Uh, anyway, we, we did a quick analysis, just counting the boxes and stuff. And then we did, looked at the data. They had 37% of their working process was waiting to be to go through quality control. Quality control was the bottleneck. The reason that it wasn't noticed by anybody is that it wasn't in SAP data. There were no time per parts. It was considered an indirect operation. Uh, and so there were no uh, capacity load calculations. Uh, so uh, we, that was step one, right, of the theory of constraints. Identify the bottleneck. There it is. Uh, and people ask me, you know, how do people react when you when you do that? Uh, a lot of people sort of smile to, uh, and say, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've been saying that for a long time. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, so we, we then exploited it. That was very simple. It was out of 400 people, there were nine uh, production quality uh, control uh, operators. So we helped them work better. Uh, we added a few people for a few days. Uh, we did sort of normal, uh, normal work to improve their efficiency. And as a result, uh, within two weeks, the factory was producing 45% more, 45% more. Um, everybody was, was very surprised because I say this was a 10-year-old problem and they tried all sorts of solutions and they hadn't worked. And suddenly, within two weeks, it could it was more or less instantaneous. Uh, they were producing 45% more parts. Uh, everything else in the factory followed, even those so-called overloaded, uh, fancy-looking bottlenecks. And uh, that uh, caught up the backlog. Uh, we implemented drum buffer rope. And uh, the due date performance shot up uh, to, to already sort of average uh, industry standards right now, as I speak. And we're working right now to get up to over 95% due date performance. And normally uh, the uh, 2016 target will be 99.5% performance. Um, well, that's just, you know, uh, our, our, our daily work. Very fast, very impressive results uh, on, on the one side, you know, talking in results in days and sometimes minutes, weeks anyway. And also a, a long-term view uh, to, to, to build very, very uh, durable, long-lasting results after we, we've gone. Um, I think I mentioned it to you. One of the strange things about our work is we, I tell people right from the beginning, we, we, we will, you know, there will be sparks in the first few weeks and impressive results. Uh, but after that, this is going to take five years. Okay. Yep. And so we, we're, we're quite active with them for about one year or two, depending on the size of the problem, the size of the firm. And then we do uh, three years after sales service where we come back and see them once or twice a year to make sure that it's still improving, they're still moving ahead, uh, and so forth. So that, that's, uh, that's just a one, the one, one current story. Uh, and then right now, just as I speak, where we've got four, four similar stories in, in, in Europe going on like that. All right. So can I – it was one thing it, – it, sorry, I need to think how to say this. So – I I read the goal in 1996 or 7 I think it was and it it was this might sound stupid to, to other people but it was only when I talked to you uh, a couple of weeks ago that I realized that those five focusing steps um are just a recipe that that they're just a simple recipe that if you know them you you pull out your back pocket and you just go through and you can just repeat them over and over and again um, in different situations without needing a huge amount of context, um, which almost makes it seem too easy. And, and 
so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a question here, right? Is it too easy? C c why isn't everyone doing it if it's so easy? There are, there are a number of... Uh, it takes a while to answer that question. Um, there are a number of reasons. Um, I'll start with, 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 with the two main, main ones. Uh, the first is that uh, we're talking in manufacturing. Uh, in manufacturing, the entire world has been mostly changed by uh, Toyota Motor Corporation and the Toyota way, the Toyota system, just in time, lean, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that has got a sort of 90, 99% market share and everybody does it or claims to do it. Uh, so uh, since Toyota does not use the theory of constraints, people you know, uh, in a very sectarian fashion, they say, no, I'm, I'm doing lean. Uh, I want to be like Toyota. I want to become number one to, uh, doing it the Toyota way. <coughs> and as a result, uh, other ideas, whatever they are, uh, such as the theory of constraints, have a, an uphill battle to, to, to get management's attention. Okay, I could talk about that a, a lot more. Um, as to the, the other reason, um, well, you, you say that the, f the five focusing steps are, are, are marvellous. I, I think they're wrong. I think the five focusing steps are wrong. Uh, and I'm, I'm saddened that uh, they're still presented as, as the, the, the way of doing the theory constraints. I, I don't agree at all. Um, the, the, the first steps are okay. Identify, exploit subordinate, elevate. Uh, so you're, you're getting more and more out of your bottleneck until step five. Uh, there's a resource somewhere, there's something in the system that can't keep up and that becomes the new constraint and you're meant to, 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 to go on to that uh, second constraint and, and so forth. Um, I'm okay with that probably the, the, the first year, the first, uh, the first iteration because uh, maybe we'll talk about it. Uh, often people have the, the wrong bottleneck or a bad bottleneck in the factory, right? The example I just gave of quality control, that's a very bad bottleneck. Um, but my, my view of the theory of constraints is, is uh, that if you practice just the five focusing steps, you're being very short-sighted short and iterative. You have no strategy. You're just bottleneck hunting. And I don't like that. That's not my way of doing theory of constraints. Um, my idea is that, Ellie quite rightly said, uh, all the systems are unbalanced, right? Or factories are unbalanced, the unbalanced plant and stuff. Uh, that, that goes back to the goal. That is obviously true. And what's interesting is it's more and more true. That's to say the theory of constraints is more and more pertinent. Um, but that doesn't mean that you, will, you have to just go around uh, blindly going from one bottleneck to the next with your five focusing steps. What you can do is choose the, the best bottleneck or the, the least worst bottleneck if you prefer and then surround it by excess capacity okay so uh what i do is initially we just you know do, do the, the the standard uh, theory of constraints but very quickly we start asking ourselves where would the bottleneck sh where should the bottleneck be in the system and we organize uh the factory in that way um uh, and that's very my, 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 my clients you know, think that makes a lot more sense. It's a lot more stable. One of the things, I mean, you're, you're changing the whole focus, the whole organization when you change a bottleneck or a constraint from one place to another. You don't want to do that every six months. It's, uh, it takes a while to, you know, to organize things around one particular constraint. So you need to keep that steady. Um, so that's what we do normally, sometimes quite quickly. Sometimes it takes a year. We end up with you know, a chosen bottleneck surrounded by a chosen quantity of excess capacity in the non-bottlenecks. Um, that's, that's a short reason. Why don't people do it? I don't know. Um, I, I do it, my clients do it, and it works. And it's quick. <laughs> it's quick, yeah. Uh, it's quick. The, um, I think I mentioned it. The, the other story that the, my, my personal record is this one. Uh, that is the, the, the uh, rotor of an alternator, a car alternator. Uh, that goes back to 2012. Uh, it was a. I was called in uh, urgently because there was a big problem between the, uh, let's say, one of the three largest um, uh, car manufacturers in the world and one of the ten largest uh, equipment uh, manufacturers in the world, uh, and they were they were they were fighting with knives and stuff because the whole of the North American continent was being slowed down by the supplier who was not supplying enough alternators for the whole continent. 
they called me into a very uh, well I've never been in such a uh, stressed out factory in my life uh, they had sent this is a, a large organization with over 100 factories they'd sent 11 of their best plant managers to the plant to manage it from all over the world so there was a plant manager behind every machine nearly uh, it was a 1,000 person factory uh, in Mexico and uh, what had happened you know people wonder about where uh, the reputation of the theory of constraints is this uh, original equipment tier one manufacturer uh, is probably one of the leanest in the world uh, in 10 leanest in the world they have since 1970 a, uh, a lean system a uh, very reputed uh, system and they've been using that uh, until I arrived okay and I was told when the boardroom decided to call upon me it was it went like this well guys we've done everything we tried all the lean tools we have we tried all our best lean sensor and stuff what can we do and this quiet little voice from the end of the back of the boardroom said maybe we should try the theory of constraints we've got nothing else to lose you know uh, and so there, here I come uh, in obviously fairly hostile territory with my, you know, we talk about the, the, the sect of the theory of constraints not being very open to lean, but the lean sect is not very open to theory of constraints. So they, they, were, they, they met me with machetes and stuff. Uh, and I turned up. Anyway, uh, I identified the bottleneck, step one. That was very easy to do because they have in their system they have a little sign, a little panel next to the machines that says this is the bottleneck, right? Um, right. Okay. Uh, so they had a sign up, uh, and I went over just to, to have a look, and uh, I checked it out because, you know, I'm suspicious sometimes people get it wrong, but it was the right bottleneck, right? So here we are in a factory. It was very, very tense because uh, they were not uh, supplying Detroit and all the other manufacturers sufficiently. Uh, it was costing them... 10 million euros a week in, air, in aircraft, uh, also everything, everything. It was just catastrophic. Um, and so here I was uh, in front of uh, the, the bottleneck, or rather there were two bottlenecks according to the two product families in, in the factory, 1,000 people. Um, so I, I spent, uh, what, three, four hours watching the bottleneck, just sitting there watching it uh, in, a, in a very sort of lean gember walk fashion. Uh, and then I waited until night time uh, when most of the management went out, went away to sleep. And I implemented the theory of constraints uh, without telling anybody. What I did was uh, put a buffer in front of the uh, bottleneck, uh, just a, a three minute buffer to start with, a four minute buffer, 12, 12, 12 these parts. Uh, because I noticed that the machine was stopping because it was, uh, there were problems upstream. And within uh, 15 minutes, the throughput had increased by 17%. Okay, can I play that back to you? Yeah. You, did you sneak in? Yeah. Yep, you snuck in and you popped a tiny little buffer of a dozen or so, um, so, so, so that the, the, the bottleneck didn't run out of work. And then you snuck away, and then the following day, well, the numbers went up. The, yeah, no, well, the, the, the numbers were already good for that shift. Um, and, uh, well, of course, when, when the, 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 the lean experts turned up and they said, what the hell's going on here? This is the best production runs we've ever had. Uh, I explained what I'd done. Uh, it, was, it was, you know, as I say, a lot of tension, a lot of uh, a very high stake uh, job. Uh, but... Um, it worked, uh, and it solved their problem. We, we did more stuff than that. Uh, we increased the factory throughput by about 35% in three months using the theory of constraints because of uh, in various ways. And, um, uh, and that was it. And I think I told you one of the things, one of the fun moments was when uh, I'd done that. I can remember it was the, the following night, well, a evening, and uh, the production manager, the, the historical production manager, the guy who was actually from the plant, right? I remind you, there, 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 were, there were 10 others that had been flown in from the world. But anyway, he calls me into his office and he, said, he, said, he looks around, closes the door, and makes sure nobody's looking. And he goes to the bottom of his bottom drawer and he pulls out a copy of the goal and says, yeah, you did it, yeah. I never dared do it here, but you're right. You know, I, I used the goals, great stuff. And quickly put it away again, and off, and, and on we went. Anyway, that's uh, 
that's one of the things about the, the fast results. Yeah, it can be, it, it really can be more or less instantaneous uh, with, with the theory of constraints. Uh, people talk about the one percent, ninety-nine percent, the focus way b beyond Pareto's twenty eighty. It's very, very true. Uh, if you think about this one, you've got two of the world's largest firms uh, fighting. Uh, why? Because they have alternators that are late. So it's in the alternator division. In which factory? In Mexico. In Mexico, there were 21 autonomous production units. In those 20 autonomous production units, two of them were bottlenecks. In those autonomous units, there were 15 machines. Of those 15 machines, one was a bottleneck. You got to the bottleneck. And when you looked inside, you keep focusing, right? So now we've got a, th a problem of about this size. It turned out that it was some parts of the operation of that uh, that we could improve. And even when we improved sort of 0.5%, 0.5 seconds of, of, of machine time there, okay, they were making about, you know, sort of a million dollars more uh, a week. Uh, wow. that, that's focus. And that's what the theory of constraints can do, can always do. Uh, if you know where to look, uh, and that's why you know, obviously, I'm, I'm passionate about the theory of constraints because only the theory of constraints can really do that. Um, and uh, don't ask me why people aren't doing this all over, all over the place because it works. Yeah, there seems to be lots of little pockets of it happening around the place, and loads of people buying the goal over the years, um, but not all that many sort of using it. E even in my world, um, the the Kanban community, which is you know a type of uh, agile development, which, which is based on um, but based on TOC. David Anderson, who you know who named it and kind of drives the, that that particular movement. Um, you know his his background is is TOC, and yet when you read stuff uh, from coming from the Kanban community, they almost think oh, bottlenecks don't matter, but they still have bottlenecks. I think they just handle them um, by limiting whip. Uh, and, and and working that way, but th this kind of it, it, it bothers me because it's this rather magical little thing, um, which I think will make the world better if, if, if everyone just thought that way, and and we don't. Anyway, yeah, can I change um, tack? Oh, sorry. No, I was just thinking. The um, one thing clearly that uh, I, I whatever my personal opinion is, I don't think that really matters. All my clients, all the people doing this stuff that I'm talking about. None of them like the term theory of constraints, okay? Uh, no. None of them use the term theory of constraints. They call it constraint management. They call it something else, business excellence or whatever. Uh, clearly, the, the word theory, uh, with regards to the community I'm working with, you know, trying to make money and, uh, and so forth, is, is just uh, doesn't, can't accept that term. Um, and um, uh, that, that's okay with me. I don't mind what it's called as long as we, we agree what we're doing. No. Um, and I know that, you know, I've just lost half my audience. They've just clicked off. But, uh, no, I, you know, I, historically, you know, Ellie, Ellie Goldratt was, uh, was allowed to say what he called it. And, uh, he, and I, know, I know very well why he called it the theory. Um, and then there's something that's more in the domain of, of marketing, whether it's truthful, logical or whatever, to call it something else. Uh, I think... Uh, Many of us know why Ellie wanted to call it theory. It just uh, doesn't sell that well. Um, so um, anyway. And it's funny because it only... Actually, you, you, you were part of the community then. What, do, do you remember when it became the, the theory of constraints? Because it wasn't in the original goal and it never made it into the, the second edition of it. Um, I, I never knew the name until much later. I'm the, the, the world's expert on this. I think it's when uh, he sold out of creative output and created the uh, uh, the Goldine Institute and so forth. So we're now in uh, 89, 90. Right. Uh, I would say that's when he started using it. I, but uh, right. historians of the theory of constraints will know much better than me. I'm, I'm going to go try and hunt that down, actually. Because uh, it, 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 I, I imagine... Um, well, actually, I, I, I imagine as a good scientist... It, it was a good name, uh, and yet as a marketer, um, it's not nearly as sexy as Six Sigma or Lean. Or... Uh, no, 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 I disagree. And I think people uh, spend too much time uh, worrying about the name. Uh, theory constraints is not a very good marketing term, but nor is Lean and nor is Six Sigma. I mean, try and sell something called Six Sigma. I mean, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, true, true. Uh, I couldn't do it. Uh, no, no, it's, uh, it doesn't help. 
but uh, let's not spend too much time thinking about it because uh, the, the competition doesn't have a very good name either. No. And I, I don't like the term competition, by the way, but the, the others, right? So, so let me change tack here a little bit. Um, so there's, there was something you said to me the other day which, which annoyed me immensely because it was one of those... It, it didn't really. It, it was one of those insightful little comments which I had lurking in the back of my mind um, and I'm not quite sure how to react to it. Uh, so I said um, the follow-up book to, to my book, um, the, the, the next business novel that, that I do, assuming I ever actually finish it, f following this one. After reading this. This one, yeah. yeah. After reading that, you'll... So, so that one's about speeding up um, projects and finishing them on time and sort of... But, but by almost by accident, making more money, making a lot more money by um, but, but by doing that. The, the second book is actually where they focus on on, on making more money. And I, I, I want to call it um, the snowball effect uh, for, for, for reasons that I'll, I'll, uh, will become clear when people read it. Um, but it's all about uh, turning um, software development into a, 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 a money making machine, really. Now, one of the problems I have um, is that I don't actually care about the money side, um, that, but, but I do. I, I do immensely because it's the, the justification we, we have for doing all these things. And what I find is a lot of people who have my background, which is you know, basically engineer, programmer, um, we, we seem to find the, the idea of making money off-putting. So, so what you said to me is, is I said, well, look, I've got this, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking of coming up with a little sort of short book, you know, that, that explains this stuff in terms of, of making money. And I'm going to, I can't remember, I'm going to call it something else. Um, and you said, why don't you call it um, how to make a lot more money uh, in, in, with software development or something like that. And I go, that's exactly what I want to say. But I find that most of the people that I talk to actually find the whole idea offensive. So, so now I've just rambled on a bit. Do you sell the, the idea of making more more money and how do you who, how do you find people react to that um, and what would you advise me to do I, I I was thinking some more because of this discussion I wanted to go back and, and reread the last pages of the goal because I, it seems to me in the goal already at least in the later editions Ellie Goldratt wrote uh, is the goal really to make money uh, asking the open question and uh, th there are many discussions about that. And I think, in my opinion, and maybe that's what Eli Goldratt was hinting at when he had, wrote that, is that the, the, the ultimate and only goal is not to make money. Uh, it is probably a, a necessary condition, uh, a necessary condition for, for, for another goal, which is, uh, you know, uh, will be different from one person to another as to what they want to do to, to, to have the most fulfilling life possible. Anyway, to come back down to, to what I do with my clients, uh, yeah, we talk about making money or, or losing less money. Um, and uh, once we got above the threshold of you know, not dying, uh, we, we, we discuss how to make more money. But it's usually a, a necessary condition with a, a larger, more beautiful project. Uh, and again, you can take whatever re uh, reference you want, uh, but already Toyota was one of those. Toyota's goal in life was not to uh, uh, make more money. It was to you know, become the largest and best uh, car manufacturer in the world. Uh, and a necessary condition to do that was to, to, to make money. And I think uh, all the work I do with my clients is, is that um, for, for about... Sort of two thirds of my work, uh, the companies, uh, you know, have a lot to improve, and they're not in good shape, and they, they're, they're not, therefore, no longer thinking sort of five or ten years ahead. So the first thing there is just to reassure them that they can they can survive, and they're not going to disappear, and so forth. And once you've got that, uh, then you ask the question: oh, well, So, what do you want to do in life? Where do you want to go? And uh, so there's a project uh, to do uh, this or that. The, the case I mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, they make flight control systems. Uh, flight control systems in the past have been hydraulic, uh, and now they're becoming more and more electrical. And these guys do, 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 uh, are good at that. And so, you know, they just want to make sure that in the next 30, 40 years, 
they become the, the, the reference guys in terms of flight control systems uh, el electrically powered. And one of the necessary conditions is to make money, but uh, they, they're at last spending the time to, you know, to do their research and development and prepare the products of the future um, to go to the, to the electric plane. Um, anyway, I don't know if I, I've answered the question, but... Uh, yeah, no, that's actually been helpful. That, that, that has for me, because I, I, I know I did a talk um, a few years ago, and it, actually it was with the government. Um, it, it, sorry, it was, it was in Wellington in New Zealand, where um, I'm from, and I suggested my talk was uh, how to use, uh, to, to, to make more money and, and, and so on, um, using agile and theory of constraints. And the, the guys there actually said to me, uh, actually call it something different. Uh, because most of the people are here, a um, big, big proportion of them are actually government or they're um, developers who, who, who don't actually care about making more money so long as they get a good, um, you know, so long as they don't go broke. Uh, so I guess it's, it's sort of a marketing juggling act for me that I'm, I'm trying to figure out. But So thank you. Yeah. Now, can we change tack again? Do you mind talking about ambition? No, no, it's, it, it's, it's, very linked to, it's very linked to what we just mentioned. Um, I don't know. Uh, we do um, uh, most of our business, uh, nearly all our business in Europe, uh, a lot in France and, and, and other European countries. Uh, we're not in particularly good shape down here right now, right? And it's not a, a crisis, as some people say. It's just a new world, right? We're, we're, we've got emerging nations and... Uh, other countries in the world that are at last uh, starting to, to, to become uh, competitors. Uh, we have to, to face that. So uh, there's a lot of problems, especially in, in, in industry where I work or operations. Uh, and this has very much dampened the ambition of the average manager I, choose, I, I, I meet. And uh, often they're just in a sort of survival mode. I hope, I hope this will last until I retire sort of thing, right? Their ambition is just survival. Um, so uh, that's why, in many ways, uh, the theory of constraints in those first few minutes, hours, days, with its focusing power and the, the speed with which you can change results, is uh, very useful to, to deal with ambition for, uh, initially. Because basically, uh, they've, they've got into a world where they're hoping to make, you know, sort of... A, a uh, 3%, 7% improvement in that, and a 3% and 7% thing in that, and quality in this, and so forth. Um, which is not, for me, uh, ambitious at all. Um, so if you can show them that you can do sort of 30, 40, 50, 60% more uh, real in their, in, in their system, uh, and uh, then once they see that, you can discuss ambition with them once again. And say, okay, what 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 do we do? You know, uh, several people have picked up, and I like it. Uh, one of Ellie's remarks, you know, even the sky is not the limit. And I think in in the world I live in, in operations, that people don't realise the the very wide spread between the best and the worst. Right? Uh, people are all crying over here about the state of uh, French industry, but in France, uh, 250 kilometres that way is one of the most efficient car assembly plants in the world. Uh, it belongs to Toyota, it's in Oudin, and it's here in France. So which just you know, goes to show a French company uh, with all the, 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 the context could uh, be one of the best in the world. Uh, there's, there's proof here already. And so uh, there are a number of these things that I, I, I go through with, with our clients to uh, <clears throat> make their level of ambition much, much higher. And uh, I guess that's something that's uh, particular to me and why I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, maybe I'm not a, a consultant, I sometimes consult, consider myself a, a resultant or whatever, um, doing resulting. Uh, the ambitions that I try and uh, convince people they should have is always with regards to what I believe their potential is. And it's, that's very, very high. And it's a lot higher, nothing to do with what their initial ambition was. Um, the case again to come to you know give you a, a one story in the background of these people who were making these uh, flight control systems. They had very bad unit performance. Their target was to get to seventy five percent, and I said no, that's not a target at all. It has to be ninety five percent as soon as possible, and let's try and hit a hundred percent or ninety nine point five percent. 
uh, as soon as possible. And the the financials of it is the same. You know, why don't we make money uh, doing this stuff? Um, I don't know, don't know if I've answered your question, but yeah, I personally, it's my, one of my jobs in with regards to our projects, where the, the, the teams are actually doing, you know, the drum buffer ropes, the critical chains and stuff. And I try and help the the CEOs and the boards to, to you know, say, with all this, where are you going? How how far? How fast can you go? Um, because there's a real deficit of ambition in, in the average uh, boardroom today in, in here in Europe. I know that that resonated with me when you, you when you sort of talking about those things, and then I came back and my bosses asked me, "What did you get out of Paris? So, you know, did you have a good time? Yes, I had a good time. Did you have any good food? Oh yes, I had some good food. Uh, did you learn anything?" And I go, "Actually, you know." I think in the last six months, I've become a bit placid, a bit timid, uh, and my ambitions have just sort of, just sort of, I've just become happy with, you know, we, we, we've made quite a lot of really significant improvements, um, and then I was just kind of happy with that, so it was, it was good, I, 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 I sort of started to figure out what we need to do next, um, and, uh, and, and so that, that's your fault <laughs> again. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, but, and again, to, to, to honor Ellie's, Ellie's writings, I, I say I have trouble with the five focusing steps. Uh, it's written in big with uh, four exclamation marks after it if you do, if you do your, if you write it up correctly. Beware of inertia, uh, right? And uh, that, that's obviously very true. It's true in a number of ways. Both a drum buffer rope and critical chain can uh, put your systems under control and give good performance. Okay, so you're you're here and suddenly you'll go up here and you're and you're like that, and you can fall asleep on that. You can fall asleep on those buffers, fall asleep on that performance. Okay, um, theory constraints in the manufacturing drum buffer rope can make you uh, make money and deliver on time, uh, even in a bad factory. Okay. And uh, so that's the danger. You set it all up; it's all tuned nicely, and it's, it all seems to be running okay. But you're not. Uh, you, you've fallen asleep on your buffer on your system, okay? And critical chain is the same. You can do, you know, fifty percent reduction in in the durations and finish all your projects on time and stuff. And people say, okay, good. Now we're, we got where we're good. Um, but you know, are you are you developing the right product? Uh, why aren't all your products bestsellers? Stuff like that. Yep. So uh, there's yeah, plenty of places to go. There's a lot of work to do, even once you've you've mastered the the, the talk solutions. I would like to be able to explain to ordinary people um, who don't work in factories and and don't know the idea of of coming up with a balanced line. Yeah. Why balancing factories and projects? Because this is a real problem I actually have with one project now. Why balancing them and taking all that spare capacity out sucks. Can, can you help me with that? Because for me, that's, uh, that's easy because um, um, our work overlaps in, in, in the area of software development and that we do 50% uh, of our work is, is critical chain, project management, new product development. And uh, in these new products, in today's new products, uh, there is more and more software in there. Okay, so uh, I don't know if people realize that today the development costs of a new uh, a new airbag for a car, it's now got to sixty percent software, right? It's because it's you know spending all its time thinking and taking decisions and stuff. Um, so we we've got a lot of um, software development work going in um, attached to to a product. <coughs> So uh, how do I explain it? Um, well, I, I, I give it my personal version because that's, that's the way I, I live through it. I, I started off on the shop floor in factories, practicing the theory constraints. Okay, and when you try and manage a factory, you have quite a lot of data, right? You've got the time per parts, you've got the machines, their calendars, the, the shift patterns, and stuff, and you've got MRP, ERP systems, so you can you can do calculations and and do. Uh, SNOPs and, and try and uh, have a balanced plant, right? And in fact, uh, every end of year you will prepare a budget for the following year, okay? 
um, with all this data, and you'll do the calculations with the forecast, the order book, and whatever. And forget the, 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 the forecast inaccuracies. Uh, this happens even with people I'm working with in aeronautics that have an order book full for the whole of next year. Right? There's no uncertainty in demand. Um, so they've got all that. They've got their lovely computer with nice uh, with a, with the mouse and multicolored screen and stuff. And they do their budget and they say, right, okay, that's it. We've done the budget. There are there are 16 people here because we worked out that 18 people would be too many and all that stuff. So we have balanced the plant. Okay, and off they go. Well. That is completely wrong, absolutely and completely wrong, and I've done it a hundred times, uh, and it's never, not, nobody's come close to a balanced plant. Okay? In, in, with these guys, some, one of the best factories in the world, or one of the hundred best factories in the world, okay? there was 30% excess capacity in half the factory. Okay? Because this is the rotor, it's the inside tart that goes around, and there was a casing, a box that goes around it. Uh, the factory had two halves, the, the inside and the outside, and in the outside part, I, I, when we'd finished, We'd gone up 35% factory wide. We hadn't add, had to add any capacity in half the, in that half of the factory. Anyway, so even when you have all the data, you have a very very unbalanced plant. Okay, uh, and the reason is that all that data is wrong, uh, and um, so just don't believe that your budget means you have a, a, a balanced factory, a balanced set of operations. You just uh, Ellie Goldratt once again. Tell me how you're measured, and I'll tell you how you behave. Uh, since you are, your target is to balance the plant, you will get the computer to lie for you and say, okay, boss, here we are. Everything's balanced. I'm ready for next year. Okay? And yeah, no, that's completely stupid. Um, so that's when you have all the data. You go into the project world, uh, where I started a bit later on, and you don't have any of that data. I mean, how long does it take to develop 200 lines of code? How long does it do to draw a new uh, turbine for a, a, a new aircraft engine? How long does it take to do that and this and whatever? So all those times are wrong, okay? And yet again, people with this wrong data say when they design a project, when they plan a project, uh, you know, I've got the right number of people. I've got 20 people here because I don't need 30. And uh, off they go. In that world... The uh, imbalance, the, the, the discrepancy between the constraints and the non-constraints can be at least a factor of three. That's to say that's three times more, more capacity in, in the system than needed. It can be a factor of ten. I've found projects in which there are ten times more people or ten times more capacity in part of a project with regards to what was actually required. Okay, uh, But you, you don't see that because all, all the data is wrong. And uh, when you are a non-bottleneck, in uh, a project of uh, software development or product development, it's quite easy to uh, fake work. I mean, you, you, let's take people who are here, okay? You just rework it and tune it and redo your software and retest it and whatever, uh, and keep yourself busy. It's a lot easier to, to look busy in the uh, immaterial world than it is in, in, the, in the factory world. So uh, anyway, the, the, that's the speech. And then you, you prove it quite quickly by identifying the bottleneck and saying, you see, uh, these people can only do so much, and these people, in fact, they, they can do three times as much. And uh, it just all, all makes sense. Um, and what is more and more surprising is, and that's why I find the theory of constraints getting more and more pertinent, is that as life moves faster and faster in various ways, new technology, new, new markets, new products, and so forth, People just have less and less time to, 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 to reduce the imbalance in the system. And so the, the systems are more and more unbalanced. So the theory of constraints should be being used more and more and more uh, as the world just gets more and more chaotic and people don't have the time. Um, so that, that's, that's me and unbalances and uh, imbalanced systems and constraints. Uh, I see them everywhere and it's, you know, there are just more and more of them. Yeah, I, I I like that the 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 case I'm thinking of is a, a project I helped resuscitate and got it sort of nicely set up with uh, development. It was initially testing being the bottleneck as it almost always is um, in my experience, and then over time it transitioned to be development in general, and then just a few vital few experts in the middle of it, 
uh, and we kind of had that set up and smoothing and then smoothly running and then just over time things changed and it was kind of around the the, the top it was kind of like thin on the the, the top the the people feeding in the work into the teams uh, and the, the 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 number of managers or the, the management capacity slowly got chipped away slowly 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 until effectively it's it's kind of it's become sort of like a a, a a poorly balanced line and it just happened a little bit little bit little bit over time uh, but it's, it's only it, it took me um, embarrassingly it took me quite a while to to realize that this is actually what happened but it is it's really important so look, we have just um, two minutes I need you to um, to give me two things one is um, a book recommendation for everyone else everyone who's watching it what book should they read apart from the goal Apart from that one. <laughs> I would recommend this uh, new book that's just come out. It's a very hot bestseller called Rolling Rocks Downhill. It's written by a sort of a Scottish show New Zealander, uh, yeah. um, Clark Ching. Uh, uh, and it's all about uh, putting theory constraints, agile and lean together. Um, not to make money. He doesn't want like making money. That's the next book. Uh, but uh, that's true. <laughs> that's, uh, this is the this is the book I recommend. Right. Well, thank Stanley. you very much. That, that's very kind of you. Right. That has been outstanding. Um, and can't wait till the next one. Yeah.